chapter four, if it is a corn, let's start. I'm always game for starting on time. Quitting early. And they can get so let's go. <laughs> <laughs> where I've been working either. Oh, it's orderly. Let's go. All right. If everybody's ready, we'll uh, bring the meeting to order. Uh, agenda May 6, 2014. Item number one, approval of summary minutes for the April 15, 2014 regular meeting. We'll look for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the minutes as printed. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor and okay by saying aye. 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 Same sign opposed. Motion passes. Moving forward to public hearing items, uh, application CU 14-3, filed by Warren Ediger on behalf of ISIS Shrine, requesting approval of a condition use permit to allow a fraternal service club establishment in a C7 zoning district. We'll hear from city staff, Dean. Mr. Hers will have this staff. Okay, Dustin. Just a little short background on the subject property. It was originally constructed as a restaurant that was in tandem with the old Salina Inn on East Diamond Drive there, and that was built in the 1960s. At a later date, um, in 2004, it was split off and the restaurant was significantly demolished and renovated in 2005 for Ponderosa Steakhouse that operated at this facility um, for a little over a year or so after it, its opening in 2006. That's the history here and today the nature of of our meeting and our public hearing is that the ISIS Shriners have purchased the property and are looking to use the facility for their new fraternal club organization home in Salina. The property itself is zone C7 and what that means, the history of that is in 1990 the city of Salina recognized that we were fortunate enough to have a number of interchanges with some major interstate highways and so recognizing that as a benefit and recognizing it as a finite resource it was decided that those interchanges should have specific zoning that would limit or reserve those properties for businesses that catered to the traveling public so the idea is that the C7 district is designed for hotels, restaurants, and other retail type businesses that attract and pull travelers into our community and spend money in our community and, and do business with our, uh, our businesses in those locations. And so when that was decided to convert the property from C5 to C7, one of those limitations it was was that the use of a fraternal or service club became conditional and no longer permitted and that's the reason we're here today is to have a public hearing on that item to see if this particular location is suitable from both a locational standpoint and from a site development standpoint for a fraternal service club in the name of Isis Shriners. So if we want to look at the uh, zoning ordinance itself, you'll see on page three of the packet, there's a, a little table there showing the required bulk regulations as it relates to the existing bulk regulations. And there are no issue, issues there with any of the bulk regulations. The site as a whole is, is conforming to most of the zoning requirements there are two exceptions to that and both of those exceptions stem back to that redevelopment that took place in 2005 as part of the Ponderosa Steakhouse project and what happened there is you had a site plan that was approved by city staff and a landscaping plan that was also approved and the landscaping plan, when we have a, a substantial redevelopment of an existing site, the idea is we may not get into full compliance with the landscaping regulations, 
but we, we work to get as much landscaping as we can and to try to meet that intent. And when that happened, there were a number of shade trees that were proposed in, I say concept, because the plan didn't actually specify the specific planting type, but just said that there would be five shade trees in the Diamond Drive front yard and then an additional three in the islands, parking islands between the building and the interstate highway. And I bring up these two nonconformities, the landscaping and the parking, because the landscaping was never installed and then the parking was striped. However, it was striped not according to the approved plan. Uh, it's our understanding that at the time the st striper came in, saw the plan that the project designer had developed and said, well, I can get more parking spaces on there and striped it. But when he did that, the dimensions busted on them and they don't meet the minimum dimensional requirements. For instance, there's a lot of parallel 90 degree stalls on this west end. In order to have 90, de 90 degree stalls on this side and parking stalls on this side, you would need to have more distance there than what they have. Um, in addition, you've got, if we can go to the site plan, John, that might be a little bit easier to see the striping. In addition, you've got this parking row along the south property line that doesn't have the full dimensions here because of the convergence of an, an angle of this rear lot line. So you don't have the full depth required for all those parking stalls. So um, the parking lot layout, while it isn't completely lost and just awful, there's a lot of areas where we don't have the, we're not meeting the dimensional requirements. So the landscaping and the parking would be the two areas of, of concern as far as the zoning regulations are concerned. Now, the actual number of parking spaces, the architect for this particular project has identified that there would be a facility need of 120 off-street parking spaces based on the occupant load of the building as a fraternal club organization or assembly space. And the space currently has 89 off-street parking spaces. And when I say off-street parking spaces on this side, I'm talking about the parking stalls within this box here. And that's important because there's an additional 32 spaces on the neighboring property to the east that you see here, and it's labeled on the site plan as a shared parking, and so you've got an additional 32. That brings your total of, of parking to 121, so they do have enough parking as it is. Um, the, the question is making sure that the parking lot is configured in stripes so that it adheres to the dimensional requirements of the parking regulations. Screening, typically you would have screening in the front yard area for uh, any parking lot that has more than six parking stalls. In this particular instance, I believe there was um, a plan for some screening, as I mentioned. Most of that screening would be taking place in the actual right-of-way, or what would be the right-of-way, because another strange thing about this property is Diamond Drive isn't an actual right-of-way in that area. It the property goes of the property that Isis Shriners own goes to the center line of what would be Diamond Drive, but what we would think of Diamond Drive, but that's not actual public right away. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked about landscaping signage. They would be allowed to have four square feet of signs signage per lineal foot of building frontage, which they've got substantial uh, building frontage for quite a bit of signage. We haven't seen any plans on what they plan to do as far as signage is concerned. Uh, that could be handled outside of this meeting potentially because uh, they would be required to obtain a sign permit. Uh, we just mentioned that if there are any specific limitations that you would want to have that the conditional use permit would be the opportunity to uh, voice those 
ideas. The floodplain, this particular property was removed from the 100 year floodplain. It was once in it, but a letter of map amendment has been received from FEMA. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are seven items that as part of the Ponderosa Steakhouse project were their correction items that never got completed before a certificate of occupancy was issued. We had a breakdown in communication and that certificate of occupancy was issued prior to all of those requirements being met and so we have a number of nonconformities with a bulk of those being what we mentioned with the landscaping and the parking lot striping area. So when looking at the welfare and convenience of the public, we have, to f we have to find that the proposed conditional use in this location will contribute to the welfare and convenience of the public. And so fraternal and service club organizations, as I mentioned, are considered conditional uses in this particular zoning district. And they, uh, because they do not provide a service to the general public, and are not directly dependent on random people driving uh, adjacent to their property. Now that's not to say that they couldn't be benefited by being close to the interstate and that's not to say that their use wouldn't benefit the community by having uh, close or easy access to other Shriners who may be visiting our community and meeting at this facility. It's just to say that the general public would not be uh, a part of the, the business model for this particular facility. The applicant states that the location of the proposed use will also generate some business for of the adjacent hotels because there will be members from outside the community that would be visiting this particular location. Staff believes that the, the change of use that's being proposed is very similar to the previous restaurant in that it's a meeting and gathering place where food and beverages are served only it's not to the general public like it was before with the Ponderosa Steakhouse but rather a, a, a membership of a private club the biggest and that's probably the biggest distinction and so because the intent of the C7 district is to preserve and protect land associated with interchange areas, the Planning Commission will need to determine whether or not this use is appropriate for such a location that's close to an inter interchange like this and in Zone C7. In looking at the injury to the surrounding property and domination of the neighborhood, there aren't any changes being proposed to the exterior of the building. The changes on the inside have been rather minimal and the use would still be primarily eating and, and meeting of people and having that sort of assembly that you would have with a restaurant. So I think that uh, staff believes that the effect on the certain surrounding neighborhood is really going to depend more on the form of the property and how well it's maintained and kept up. From the outside, you won't see a lot of, uh, there won't be a perceivable change. And looking at the existing utilities, this is an existing building that was designed and constructed as a restaurant, so it does have functioning utilities and that are adequate for water, sanitary sooner, and drainage. And traffic and access, there is a shared parking agreement that they have with the property to the east, the hotel here. And aside from that, they do have a non-conforming parking lot design that doesn't meet all of the required parking dimensions. And parking, landscaping and screening, we've talked about the non-conformities that we have there. Staff would like to see a actual planting plan of what the Isis Shriners would propose in, in order to try to meet that landscaping plan that was originally uh, approved in the 2005 which had five trees on the uh, north with another three shade trees in the on the south between the building and the interstate. 
the comprehensive plan shows this area as being commercial and that doesn't see any conflicts with the comprehensive plan. I think the biggest issue here that we're looking at is there's two things. One is f the Planning Commission needs to consider whether or not the location and the use is appropriate considering the intent of the C7 district of providing and preserving retail or business spaces for businesses that cater towards pub the pub traveling public at an interchange area and the other being addressing the nonconformities in the name of uh, the parking lot layout and the landscape planting design. So what we would suggest is uh, we, we've got a few alternatives listed here and the one that we would recommend would be that uh, if items number one and two under staff recommendation be addressed by the applicant prior to taking any action on their, their uh, application. If these items are addressed to the satisfaction of the commission at the hearing, staff would recommend approval of the application subject to the following conditions. And items number one and number two deal with those landscaping items that are outstanding and non-conforming and then modifying the parking lots that were adherent to the parking regulations. And then the items three, four, and five are pretty standard language for this type of a for a conditional use development in a commercial area. So items number one and two are the kind of sticky hinges on this particular application. Are there any questions of staff? Any questions of staff before? I think oh. as the applicant, uh, you've met one and worked with the applicant on this, are they okay with making the necessary revisions to address items one and two, or are they not? Um, we had talked about, at, to this point in time, what, we've, what we have is they, the applicant has applied for and attained a building permit for some restoration work in the building. And that application for that building permit was done with the limitation that it could still function as a restaurant, you can do work to it, it's, it's legal to do work there. However, they could not use it as a fraternal club until they met with this board. And so I say that because we have not actually got into the discussions of dealing with the non-conforming parking or the non-conforming landscaping. Okay. Thank you. Now we have met to talk about parking numbers, but not the actual striping of the plan. So this will be the first time they're hearing of the stripe restriping. No, the what was agreed was that we would sign off on the issuance of building permit, and that these site issues would be deferred to the public hearing before the planning commission to see how they would be addressed at that time. Okay. Uh, can we hear from the applicant at this time? My name is Warren Ediger. Uh, my business address is 631 East Crawford, Suite 211, and I'm the architect for the project. Um, I'm going to try and give you the cup is half full version of this. <laughs> um, let's start with the site plan and talk a little bit about landscaping. Um, well, first of all, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the differences between the site plan that was prepared for the restaurant and what is shown on that drawing and what you see when you go to the site. At the time that the restaurant was uh, being uh, renovated and going through a um, certificate of occupancy, <clears throat> we had a plan that had been discussed, a site plan that had been discussed with uh, planning and with building services and had gotten approval for that. The owner elected to deviate from that, did not get approval for that, nor did I know about it and submit drawings to uh, represent that. However, the certificate of occupancy went through and in essence approved what they did. Um, so what we're talking about is deviations from a plan which was presented at the permit stage 
was deviated from by the owner and was de facto accepted through the certificate of occupancy. Uh, I'm not disagreeing that what you see out there is not, not in compliance. I'm just saying that it has gone through an approval process. Uh, let's talk about the landscaping on the street side. There is one tree um, in place that's healthy and um, that's the one that shows in the photograph on the, on the site plan. It would be the one farthest to the east. The site plan shows three additional trees along the street frontage and then one next to the building. Uh, we could get two trees in there at the uh, recommended 25 foot spacing. We cannot get the um, next one which would be on the west side of the drive because the motel has put one in essentially at that spot and so we'd have two trees together and we can't uh, get them that close together. So in, in the frontage we can probably get two more. Um, again another deviation that happened uh, on, that the owner uh, decided to do was the tree that's next to the entrance to the building that was in a, a sidewalk with an island cut into it. Uh, they changed the sidewalk configuration and that's now part of the parking lot. And so there is not a place there to put that tree. Um, you're, speaking of, you're speaking of this tree warrant? That's yes. correct. Yes. Yeah, thanks. So this, this tree is actually over on that side of the property line and that's, uh, that was put in place by, I think it's Motel 6, whichever motel is there. So we can't, we can't get one in this location because of the proximity to the other tree. So basically there are two trees that we can put in that front area. Um, the original site plan called for putting trees in the islands in uh, the parking area in the back and that was part of a diagonal parking um, plan and basically one here, I think one over here and one over here someplace. This one uh, is, would not be able to go in because that's where the grease intercepted ended up being and that's taken up by access to the grease interceptor. If we create islands here and here along with uh, the diagonal parking, we're going to lose parking spaces. And uh, I, th I think a, uh, an issue we're going to have to come to an agreement on is what number of parking we're going to allow in the end because to get to the number that uh, calculates from the zoning requirements we have to count the parking that's there now even though it doesn't meet the criteria plus this in the in the easement area. The Shriners actually do not have a uh, need for that amount of parking. Their membership level and their uh, uh, use of the building uh, would be a fraction of that. However, by the numbers that are in the zoning code, when you calculate it, that's the number that you end up with. Uh, so I, I think we can discuss what, what happens when we change the angle of parking and probably lose anywhere from five to ten stalls with the new arrangement and whether that's going to be acceptable or not. A um, couple of things in general that I also wanted to talk about. Um, their membership is not solely from Salina. It comes from the north central Kansas area and so when they come they do benefit by access from being next to the interstate but they also uh, uh, use the adjacent uh, services, the motels and, and so on. Um, they uh, intend, uh, as they did at the other location, to uh, rent the facility to the public for uh, re wedding receptions and other family reunions, activities like that. So that would, uh, that function would coincide more directly with the original restaurant function that had meeting space and uh, allowed um, other uses for it also. So I think, I think it comes very close to meeting the criteria for the C7 and because this is um, an accessory use under C7. It has the implication that uh, it's close enough that we ought to give it strong consideration. And I think um, the fact that this building has stood vacant for six years after having a fresh renovation means that there's not a lot of interest in doing something that fits directly into that C7 pattern. I would um, suggest that with the parking and the landscaping um, that you authorize the staff and us to work together to come up with a solution that meets 
uh, um, site uh, restrictions and the criteria, but at the same time uh, give an approval for the C7 um, accessory use so that we can keep moving ahead on it. Uh, we'll work with the staff, come to an agreement on parking and landscaping the best that we can, and um, I think we could present a plan back, but I'd like to see the approval um, brought forward here if we can for the, C for the accessory use. Thank Any you, questions? Will. Any questions for the applicant at this time? Well, I had a quick question. I saw, yes. and I, I may not be clear about that, but I think I saw the shadow of the sign that exists there. I haven't gone out to look at it. Uh, is it anticipated that that sign spacing that you'll use the existing sign uh, to create a sign for the ISIS Shriners that fit that? John, can you go back to the photograph that shows the legs of the sign? I think that's all that shows up. I believe that's actually for the motel that's to the east. Okay. Even though it's on this property, uh, yeah, that uh, sign that's for that motel. Uh, there Got was, it. I think, at one time, a small sign here. Yeah. Um, ISIS Shrine does not intend, I, I believe, to put in a monument sign or a pole sign like that. Instead, they'll put something on the building, which requi still requires a sign permit, and they'll go through that, that process. That would be my but, question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are they going to have enough parking when they have the spring and fall ceremonials there to handle even with the hotel parking? Uh, that's my understanding from uh, the way people travel in and, and stay in adjacent motels they'll be able to. Well, I yeah, pull your microphone up to mic, you, Will. Get your mic, oh, I'm sorry. if you will. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> anyway, I just I wonder about the volume of people. Yeah, the the volume is down from that. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Warren. As staff would translate Mr. Ediger's request, if you would look at page 11 of your staff report. He is basically um, saying that as opposed to the language in condition one that establishes minimum <coughs> parameters that um, item one simply say that a, a detailed planting plan uh, for staff review and approval that we would work with him on that and you would essentially delete the succeeding sentence and and not pre determine what the final result would be and then item two would would still remain as it is um, where we would work with them to uh, see what options were available uh, for for doing that I just wanted to John if you could go back to the site plan the very original concept was that this was going to be an entrance only right here and these were going to be angled spaces along here so we had enough width here for a one-way driving aisle and angled spaces on both sides and then with circulation around back out this way and when we got out in the field for the inspections the um, inst installer had um, instead of following the designers plans of the angled spaces had on his own initiative put in 90 degree stalls determining that you could get more spaces in that way but we pointed out it was specifically designed uh, dimensionally to work with angled spaces and a and a circulation pattern like that so um, we have been basically working with in response to that since that had occurred so was an occupancy given with that configuration it yes. was yes um, but as I pointed out to Mr. Hers, one of the things that occurred after 
this is that um, certificates of occupancy could no longer be issued without my signature because this this one was issued without my signature and so it, it was out the door while planning still had some unresolved issues so today you can't get a certificate of occupancy without my signature on it but at that time it was it did not require planning's sign off so that that is how that occurred and why planning was left with some unresolved issues and so um, again as I understand Mr. Ediger's request um, he is comfortable with all five of those conditions on page 11 except he would like uh, the second sentence in condition one essentially deleted and allow instead of setting out those parameters allow uh, staff and himself to work work that out as opposed to having established minimums ahead of time. I have an observation but I wanted to check to be sure we have opened it up for any other public comment if there's anyone else that wants to comment. Any other questions for staff up here and then any public comment? Um, Warren, just for Crystal's record, could you, um, the gentleman sitting next to you, could he give us his name and address just so Crystal could have that for the minutes? John Gilpin, G-I-L-P-I-N, 631 Berkshire Drive, Atlanta, Kansas. <coughs> I, Thank I have you. A question. Huh? It, it seems to me like what we what we've got to decide is uh, is staff willing to mitigate the requirements for landscaping and parking, and if yes, or at least willing to look at it, then there's some option here. If you're not willing to look at it and you're going to stick rigidly to the requirements, then it doesn't need to be here yet. It needs to be back at the staff table talking through it. Well, if we were going to adhere to that rigidly, you would not see the uh, conditions outlined there on page 11. Okay. So um, the, the language there about submitted to staff for review and approval, basically what we wanted to do is, is point those things out and then um, to, because the building permit dealt with interior issues and this, this deals with the site, to bring this to your attention and then to have direction from the Planning Commission to say staff and architect you get together and work we take note of this but you guys get together and work this out as Mr. Ediger says it's going to be a glass half full situation we're not going to get absolute um, compliance back to what should have occurred originally but we can move this in the right direction the primary reason this is here for you today is that the the ordinance was set up for C7 to have permitted uses which are encouraged and conditional uses which go through the Planning Commission filter to say will this use here be incompatible with the intent of C7. I think the point we're making today is that even if this is used as a meeting place for ISA Shrine for 15 years, they're not doing anything that would keep this from becoming a restaurant again if that was considered to be a higher and better use. They're, they're not doing anything that's irreversible here. At this time, Chair would entertain a motion if you have. I'd like to one. just make one comment. I, uh, I'm, I'm seeing in response to Commissioner Kennedy's question, I think it's a good one, uh, that indeed staff is willing to work with Mr. Ediger and I think the suggestion is, is good and well taken. I would want to comment just as a commissioner that having been out there and looked at it recently, um, you are right Mr. Ediger since 2006 a long time to be unoccupied and it does ha have a some, something of a blight look. It's not that it's ill kept. But uh, one thing that I would like to see in working with staff is that priority be given to landscaping and more trees perhaps in those islands that you pointed out uh, and if we can get by with fewer parking spots because that affects the appearance of the place and for travelers coming through we talked about an attractive area in that 
in that specific place. And I think that would enhance it. And I do see that there's flexibility with the adjacent motel parking to accommodate the kind of crowds that Mr. Gilpin talked about. Uh, so m my request of both the architect and staff would be that there be more emphasis given to landscaping and less to parking, if that's possible. Uh, the only comment I would have is that I think the emphasis we'd like to put on would be on Diamond um, Drive for the landscaping. KDOT has planted trees along the back side of the property, along the fence, mm -hmm. and adding trees in the parking lot are going to be very difficult to maintain and probably not going to achieve very much. So if we can concentrate the effort on the front, keep the street view uh, as good as we can get it, I think we'll go a long ways towards getting it to where we want it. Okay. And they've, they're in the process of getting things spruced up over there. It'll look better over time. Well, well I would be thrilled to see it uh, cleaned up and, and put back to use. I think that'd be good for the community. I, and if the staff is willing to work with the applicant on items one and two of the five conditions they've recommended, I'd make a motion we approve CU 14-3, subject to the five conditions as outlined the staff recommendation, and that Mr. Ettinger be allowed to work with staff on modifications to the landscaping and to the parking. Second I, that. And that would be deleting the second sentence there in condition one so that that just gives us a blank slate to work with as yes. opposed to. Yes. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussions before the vote? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Same sign opposed. Motion passes. Congratulations. Okay. We'll move on to public hearing item number three, application CU 11-1A, filed by Warren Ettinger on behalf of George Stein. Request an approval of conditional use permit amendment to allow construction of additional mini storage in a C5 district area. Staff? Mr. Hers will have this report as well. The history with this particular request probably goes back to 2011 in which the applicant, Mr. Stein, had purchased a property at the corner of Holiday and Clark here that was zoned C5 and had intentions of putting up a mini storage facility and came before this board for a conditional use permit. The conditional use permit was approved and if you go out there today you will see that Mr. Stein has, um, oh sorry, thank you John. Mr. Stein has several buildings, three buildings there with different mini storage units in them. Mr. Stein came to staff here earlier this winter a, and talked to us about expanding his mini storage business to the property that he had recently required to the west that was also C5. And because of that C5 zoning, it was required that he obtain a conditional use permit in order to construct that type of a facility. Now, the, the tricky part about this particular application is the survey and understanding the property in which Mr. Stein owns and is developing or proposing to be developed as a mini storage facility. The plat, yeah, go back to the plat there, John, the last slide, that was a good one. This is the holiday edition and it shows that there are a number of easements through this area. There's a 14 foot easement with 7 feet on the south side of 14 and the north 7 feet of 15. And this was vacated as part of the original conditional use development that Mr. Stein has at the corner of Holiday and Clark here. Recently, there was an additional easement that ran between lots 12 and 13 and 14 that was also vacated. And that was identified as being an easement that was no longer used and being of conflict with a location where Mr. Stein is wanting to put a building. The issue is that we received a survey originally as part of this development that did not match the little description of the property that Mr. Stein bought or purchased. And so Mr. Stein went back to the uh, surveyor and in that event got the drawing of the property 
modified so that it, because the, the original survey showed seven feet of the holiday or the former Holiday Inn property, the hotel to the south, to be part of his property, and it wasn't. That got modified so that the boundaries were, seemed to match the legal description of the, of the deed. And however, um, when that happened, the dimensions didn't change on the survey. And staff didn't notice that until last week when we were actually looking at this very closely and doing our site analysis. And that caused us pause, so we pulled out the plat. If you'll go to the plat, John, again, plat drawings. If you'll notice, the depth here along lot 12 is listed as 150 feet. So that's the plotted dimensional <coughs> depth there. And lots 13 and 14 are both 75 feet. And the survey that staff was given shows a distance well less of 150 feet. And so we are, there's some questions about what the true dimensions are and we would like to explore that a little further. Is there something else you'd like to say about that, Dean? Well, I think the primary concern that staff has is that we got a survey, it gave us dimensions, it gave us a square footage of the area that Mr. Stein had to work with. We pointed out that the deed of what Mr. Stein purchased was seven feet less than what was shown on the survey. So we got the revised survey back that supposedly reflected the less, the lesser depth except the dimensions and the size of the lot were just the same minus the south seven feet as they were including the seven feet and that is not possible. Um, so we're, what we're trying to ascertain is what the depth of these lots are. We know that the actual measured depth is not 150 feet, but we're not sure um, that we know as we reviewed this and got ready to present the plan as, as to what that actually is and the um, the dimension on the east edge um, contains seven more feet than it does on the west edge however on the survey there's only a three foot difference between the west dimension and the east dimension. And so we know that there's a shortage in this block in terms of platted and measured. We have since matched up this piece with the lot to the east that has the, John, if you want to go to the site location map PDF. So this is what was built today. We have since determined, and it, it's very hard to see on here, but it was done by a different surveyor, but they made it much more clear, and you may have to blow that up if you can, John. You may have to blow it up even more. <coughs> okay, this shows that this lot right here has a platted dimension of 75 feet and a measured dimension of 75 feet. Do you want to slide it up please John? What this survey is showing that the one that we have for the piece to the east is that this is platted at 75 feet, this lot right here, but the measured distance is 64.48 feet. That is um, it is pretty remarkable to lose 11 feet between the platted measurement and the measured distance. This, though, was accepted and used for this building permit, and this appears to correspond with the survey that Mr. Stein's surveyor furnished us as to the east boundary. But on the east here, he has all of this lot as he goes west, it's reduced, the depth is reduced by seven feet. And we just feel like when we were preparing the report and doing our checklist for you, we could not, since we did not feel we could confirm what north-south depth 
he really had to work with there that we couldn't um, we couldn't write a report that said this plan works this plan fits this plan can be built as proposed and so our recommendation after reviewing all that was to postpone um, the consideration of the conditional use permit till we have a um, a more detailed plan. Uh, well, there's there's two reasons. One is to get the revised corrected survey. The other thing, John, if you could go back to the uh, this slide three. <coughs> This, it's difficult to read, but it says actual layout to be determined. Well, if you are the owner of this property right here and you get a letter from us saying that this is proposed to be next to you and you want to know what it's going to look like next to you um, and we can't answer that question or they come to the public hearing and they ask for an explanation of, of how close that's going to be to their property line, et cetera, and we can't answer that. We f we feel like even if this, in its final form, is is done in phases, that we need more. And the other thing is that this is based on a shared drive and being able to access the west side here. And Dustin can elaborate on this, but. We don't believe that Mr. Stroer, the owner of that, is supportive of doing the shared drive and providing the access to the west. So at this point in time, we can't tell you that this is the phase two plan or that this will work or to be able to show the neighbor, if this won't work, what's going to be built in its stead. So if, if we go to our recommendation in the staff report, there our recommendation was to postpone consideration of this to allow the surveying issues to be ironed out and also to allow a more detailed plan because this implies that in order to access these units on the west that there would be some shared access arrangement with this owner to the west and as we understand that that arrangement has is not in place at this time and maybe the applicant can indicate that it will it's not going to be in place in which case this might need to be revised before you looked at it again so we're we're happy to address any specific questions in this staff report and then we can hear public comment any questions of staff and you've talked to the applicant about this issue. They're aware of the def deficiencies here. Or is this the first time they've heard about it? Probably this is the fourth time they've heard about okay. it, but right. not this is the first time they've heard about this particular. Okay. That Mr. Stein has taken the survey back to a surveyor on, on several occasions based on questions or concerns that staff had and that we had originally dating back to the time that we advertise this because we wanted to make sure that we advertise the correct legal description of what what the subject property is so um, this particular latest concern is is somewhat news to mr. Stein okay thank you any other questions we'll hear from the applicant this time good afternoon this one's a little more difficult. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there are problems with the survey, at least in squaring it with the um, plat. However, the surveyor says that they're working off of found pins. And so wherever that difference is lost, it's lost. I mean, the property is what's indicated by the pins. And uh, I think they're going to go back through and try and confirm it again. But they've done that twice now and located those pins. And so it, I think it is what it is. I did want to address a little bit uh, a couple of things that are shown on the site plan just so you have a better understanding of what the drawing is getting at. And if I could use the. Phase one is this section, oops, um, this, this portion here. 
So we're adding on to the existing building on the west side, constructing a new building here uh, and smaller pieces here. In each case um, where we have a property line, we stay back 10 feet from the property line because of fire uh, separation distances. Uh, and so property line locations are critical because we need to maintain that 10 feet. But uh, as you can see, in most cases, we have exceeded the 10 feet. Like here, we're 15 feet. And it has to do with the module uh, dimension of the construction that's going in. This uh, 136 feet, I think, is pretty close to what it's probably going to end up being. The variation will be in how many divisions there are within the building. That, when it says actual layout to be determined, this shape is going to be what's constructed. Whether these are 10 foot wide, 15 feet wide, or 20 foot wide inside the building is going to vary based on market requirements at the time. Also, this shared drive uh, is not going to be pursued. Uh, they've had additional discussion about it, and, and we're not going to do that. But we will still maintain a minimum of a 10-foot setback from the building line, so uh, from the property line, so that we have our fire separation there. And that will cre uh, create a, a buffer on that side. And we will not have access from uh, the adjacent property to those uh, storage units. You're showing a 21-foot setback there. What appears to be a 21-foot setback there today, is, are the units going to grow to within 10 feet, or are you going to maintain the 21-foot We would We would probably increase the access aisle width a little bit, add another unit in this row, and then move this back uh, uh, either 5 or 10 feet so that we're, we will stay a minimum of 10 feet off that property line, but it's more likely going to be 11 or 12 feet. So that all the access will be internal That's from correct. the east and not from the west. That's correct. What about the two units in the southwest corner of that that you there, Warren? That yes. gets that gets reconfigured so that it's all accessible. You end up with a large unit there. Um, it, the submittal included uh, calculation of the uh, required landscape area, and we showed that we met all of that and with these kind of drive locations. When we shift over and and uh, abandon the shared drive approach, we actually increase the land front yard landscaping a little bit so our numbers will even be better, but we, we were meeting the minimums. So Warren, what, I, I'm, I'm a little lost in uh, the dimensions. We're hearing I one set too. of dimensions here, and we're <laughs> hearing a survey set of dimensions here that you feel are probably somewhat accurate, and we're hearing that they're off quite a bit. So. I don't know. We can't sit here and determine who's right we, or wrong. We, we, know, know, who's right. we know that the measured and the platted are different. Well, right. but isn't the survey accurate? What the surveyor needs to do is he needs to account for, explain how he accounts for the difference between the platted and the measured. And then the other thing is that if, if the, if the side on the west is seven feet shorter than the side on the east and the surveyor shows it's three feet shorter he's going to have to explain where the other four feet went i'm still kind of lost I, I, so we have, survey we have not a, accurate or is somebody taking a tape out there and saying that i'm not agreeing with the survey because my step i'm stepping this off and it seems to be longer i'm not sure isn't the survey accurate I don't know whether the survey is accurate. Uh, what, what the surveyor has told us is he's gone off of found pins. Uh, he can't move the pin. When he finds a pin, that's no. the corner pin, and that's what he's going off of. And that's his explanation for why it does not match the uh, plat, so the plat uh, by a substantial error, amount. Yeah. Oh, there's no doubt the plat is an error. There's a shortage in the block. What we're trying to figure out is what what that shortage is, just so we are primarily concerned with what the north-south dimension is on the west side. Okay. I'm assuming you may not know, has, has he gone then further south to find the next, I mean, to, to do, to square up that whole block? I mean, if you've got 75, if it originally is platted with 10 75-foot lots running across, can he find the other? I, I think that rest of it is a, is a single parcel uh, with a corner cut out of it, but um, I don't know whether he's gone back to identify that or not. Um, I mean, his, his point is when he finds this corner pin, that's the corner pin. And so uh, other than to explain to somebody where the rest of that 
dimension went. But I guess if I found that corner pin, and then now it says from that corner pin to the next corner pin should be 300 feet, and I get there mm -hmm. and it's 296. Yeah. And it's not really for the Planning Commission's concern or benefit, but I'll just explain one more time that the first survey we got said it was a survey of all of lots 10, 11, and 12. Yes. And it gave us dimensions and square footage. And we said, wait a minute, Mr. Stein bought those lots less the south seven feet. So we said we need a revised survey reflecting that. And when we got it, the dimensions and the square footage were exactly the same for lots 10, 11, and 12 less the south seven feet as they were for lots 10, 11, 12 in their entirety. And that cannot be correct. Well, it seems to me very clear that we've got a staff hired to take care of this. We've, there's clearly a dispute about what the legal realities are here. And so it seems the staff's recommendation to me seems pretty clear. Let's get it straightened up with staff and, and bring it back to the commission. I'll explain why we chose, because your, your next meeting is the 20th. However, um, and it's somewhat related to the surveying and other in understanding all of this, but we have yet one more easement that has to be vacated in order to allow that south building to be constructed that way. That is not scheduled to be considered by the city commission until June the 2nd. Mm -hmm. And so you would know on June the 3rd that that had been addressed. The other reason is that May your May 20th meeting is going to be devoted to vapor lounges and hookah lounges, and <laughs> they're probably not going to want to sit through all that to get to their item. So our thinking on postponing this is to June 3rd meeting is that at that point we will know what the fate is of this easement down in on, on the southeast corner. I, I guess the other side to that is uh, the conditional use application says is it okay to put mini storage there um, you'd have the option of saying yeah it's okay to do that it has to meet all the property uh, restrictions and our voluntary setbacks and in, in the landscaping which is essentially what we would have to go through no matter what uh, so if, if the question is is mini storage suitable there as part of the conditional use you could answer that question and and then nothing goes ahead until all of this survey stuff is resolved and we've got a viable plan to pre uh, present to the planning staff. I, I didn't see any. There's probably in here and when I read it I just missed it, but uh, there's intention to pave this when it goes to mini storage. Is that correct? To pave it? Pave it. Yes. It will be paved. Yeah. That was a discussion and, and the existing is the all paved. That right. All of that is paved. That was a discussion it. before yeah. when we talked about yeah. Well, the public should have an opportunity to comment on the mini storage question. Uh -huh. And I think this, t this day and also when we consider it in the future. So continuing the whole matter makes sense to me. Yeah, it doesn't hurt anything. We should still give the public a chance to address that piece well, of it. If it were continued, then we would notify those neighbors of the continuance and keep them informed, those who have contacted us. I will uh, open it up to the public if anybody's spent time here today and would like to address it for future knowledge. Anybody in the member of the public would like to address? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for action. Mr. Chairman, I'd move we continue this uh, uh, public hearing item until the June 3rd, 2014 meeting. Second. I have a motion to have a second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Kennedy first. Sorry. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor and sign aye. 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 Oppose, same sign. Motion passes. In the meantime, uh, we will try to set up a meeting between Mr. Stein's surveyor and the city's surveyor, John Harvey, and we will um, get that ironed out before it comes back to you. Uh, number four, other matters. Um, the only other matter we have for you is May 20th is, will be set aside, not for a specific text amendment, for but for general discussion of um, items that we have addressed. We are currently in a moratorium on the establishment of n any new vapor lounges or hookah lounges within the city limits of the city. There are two 
existing vapor lounges, one on East Iron and one out in Galaxy Center. Their status is in limbo until a regulatory um, land use structure is in place and the starting point for that will be your meeting on the 20th. You will have uh, planning staff, city management, city attorney, and uh, city police department representation at that meeting to answer any questions that you might have. So May 20th meeting will be devoted to that topic. All right. Okay. I've got a so, couple items. Any other items? So if you want to bring a, a secret snack lunch or something <laughs> for that. Bring, bring definition of what we're talking about. Um, number, I've got two items. Uh, one is, I don't know that this is relevant to the Planning Commission, but it seemed like the only place I could mention it. And that is, the, and I've been asked by a number of people, what is the city ordinance in regard to people soliciting at curbside in the city of Salina? I have gotten that answer from citizens at w as well who wanted me to confiscate that human sign and I have said that the zoning ordinance regulates. Their analogy was if they place a garage sale or advertising sign in the right of way, city staff will come out and relocate it or confiscate it because signs are not permitted in the right of way. A human being carrying a sign is another matter. The city does have ordinances on panhandling and that question. type of thing, and I have referred all inquiries in that regard to the Salina Police Department because they are the uh, entity that deals with enforcing panhandling laws. I, I do know that somebody could not stand in a median island at Ohio and Crawford and try to solicit funds from vehicles and uh, it's not clear to me how or why that is permitted there or if it's permitted or just being tolerated. But all inquiries that I have received I have referred to the police department. Well then at this meeting I'm publicly asking that question and I'm being told that I need to refer my question to the police department. I've had a citizen who asked me what I was going to do about it and I said planning staff or neighborhood services staff is not empowered to do anything with it, but the police department may be. Understand. Second item I had was, we talked, in, and you're just going to have to refresh my memory, we talked about a parcel that is south of, on Cherry Street, south of State Street, on the east side of the street. And, and there was some proposal to use that for storage, and I think, I, that's where my memory slips me, I think we decided we weren't going to allow that unless it was paved. But I think when I drove by there the other day, I saw pallets stacked up quite high on that parcel. Now, is that, does anybody know anything about that? I don't know anything about that. I do know that we did a sweep on South Cherry, and we're trying to sort out which. It's very difficult on South Cherry to ascertain who is owner of what, but we did detect what appeared to be some wooden pallets there. The, the Planning Commission was looking for ways to allow that to happen under some circumstances, but it was ultimately denied by right. the city commission. That same gentleman is the one who's doing the filling activity over there west of the, the oil and gas tanks on West State Street between them and the interstate on the south side. But, it, but the point is, if it was denied to do that and now it's being done, that is another violation that needs to be addressed. So I just want to make sure. Okay that that was mentioned. Yes, yeah, so if he got, it would be in the same position as the Pleasant Hill Road situation we talked about where we had a denial and the owner went ahead and did it anyway. That's right. And if we don't object to those things, then any of us have a right to disregard the ordinances and zoning requirements and do what we want on our property. Right. Any other matters? Anything to bring up? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Broad in the state, which was the main reason that lawmakers.